Right, hi, welcome to this exclusive techno interview. Today we have a real surprise and a real treat for you. We're here with the legend, John T. Rhodes, um, who for many years has been called the darling of cricket. Um, he's taken uh, probably the most unglamorous part of the sport, fielding, and turned it into something that all little boys around the world wish to emulate. John T., it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you, Roger. Good to be here. Welcome. Look at this iconic setting. Yeah, I must say, I'm always asked about you know, where are some of the best grounds to play cricket globally. And um, when you're playing at Newlands in the Western Cape, it's very tough to beat. So some of the stadiums are obviously bigger, there's more people, they jam in. But from a setting perspective, on a day like this, very tough for anybody to say, well, Newlands in the Western Cape is not the best cricket ground in the world. We're at the Western Province Cricket Club in uh, Rondebosch in the suburb of Cape Town. And uh, one of the fields here is named after one of your um, previous compatriots, Gary Kirsten, the Gary Kirsten Oval. You played with Gary? I did have a few stories about Gary Kirsten. Obviously, I can't give them all on camera. What <laughs> goes on um, on cricket team tour right. stays on tour. No, he was such an incredible team man. You know, as, a, as an opening batter, he probably had the toughest job in the world to see off the new ball. But in, in that sort of era and generation where you didn't have five coaches, the team itself had to work together and, and help each other if, if you wanted any extra, any extra batting or any extra skills being done. And uh, he then went on from a coaching perspective, having had a, a great playing career himself, taking India to, the, to a World Cup victory in, in 2011. So, you know, he's also revered in India. He's a very popular figure whenever I go, go back and if I do any work there. But he's, you know, he's, uh, most of the cricket guys are either still in commentary or they're in coaching. Um, I've done a mix of both and, and Gary is, you know, is very firmly based here in the Western Cape and you know, when you, you get an oval named after you, mm. it does mean that you've had a fairly successful career. It's not too career. late for you, maybe. No, 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 no there's, the world. well there's actually in Peter Marisburg there's a weather vane of me flying oh, really? <laughs> on top of the old pavilion of Peter Marisburg. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I'm a windy guy. Okay. <laughs> so Jonty, let's explore your earliest memories around cricket. I mean, when did... When did you realize that this was going to be your vocation, your calling in life? I'm sure you were a sporty guy at school and you had to choose between sports or? Well, it wasn't really even an opportunity from a vocation point of view. I mean, cricket, th there wasn't a sport. No sports were, were really professional when, when I was going through school and at university. So cricket, going to an all boys school at junior, at junior level and then even at high school, I mean, ended up at Marisburg College with a thousand boys. It was a predominantly rugby school. I had mild epilepsy as a youngster, so that you know, when having limitations, just as long as you know the limitations, you, you can overcome them and sort of focus in other areas. So my dad was a rugby guy, my younger brother were rugby and cricket. So there was never a choice of one or the other. At, mm. at junior school, we played four different sports depending on the term and, and what the weather was. And then getting to high school, I gave up soccer. I was playing soccer until I was 14 or 15. Uh, because it was a rugby school, we had to play at a club but I could focus on cricket and hockey. So winter sport and a summer sport. Then went to university and the same thing happened. I was playing cricket for, for Natal and also hockey for Natal. Mm. And it was never a case of me choosing cricket over hockey because uh, 1992 we were invited to the Cricket World Cup in Australia only because the, the cricketing bodies had unified and they were the only sport in the country pre-democracy that had unified. So we were invited to attend that 1992 Cricket World Cup because Dr. Ali Bacher had, had brought the, the sort of the, the governing bodies together and the, all the other sports were only then invited back onto the world stage after 1994 once we were democracy so cricket by then I was firmly established in the team and in the setup so hockey in the winter suddenly we were touring England or touring to Sri Lanka in August and mm -hmm. September so hockey had to take a back seat so you know it, it, I didn't choose cricket cricket pretty much chose me and if you look back now and you look at how the sport has developed and relative in the professional era to where we were in your days, do you ever look back with regrets saying maybe you were perhaps one generation too early? No, no regrets. And, and Roger, I mean, that's, that's been the amazing thing because the generation before me, you know, no, no matter what race you were in, in South Africa, nobody got to play any international sport. And there were some great players in, in, in that mm. generation. So my career of 11 years for South Africa, I mean, I went to four Cricket World Cups. We never won any of those. We, we didn't even get to a final, but that doesn't define my career. I mean, I was always really grateful for the opportunity. My timing was perfect. 
you know, if I was in, in the modern era, I mean, I would have loved T20 cricket. It is exciting, it's vibrant, the crowd are, you know, really involved. It's sportainment, it's not just sport. It, it's, a, it's a big part of coming down to the ground and, and families and kids having a, a great time and a great experience, not just watching cricket. So from that perspective, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful I can be a coach and be a part of it. But I think the skills of the players now, you know, some really talented players. I stood out because of my fielding. And uh, these days there's a whole generation of, of young players who are putting in great performances in the field. So it would have been difficult for me to stand out. When I was playing, you know, most guys are putting a shoe out or a boot out to stop the ball or just letting the ball go past them. So the game has evolved and, and, and I've been you know, grateful to be a part of that evolution and, and, and the constant sort of changing within the sport. But no regrets going, man, I wish, because it wasn't a, it wasn't a, um, you know, a career from a financial sense. It, it wasn't something, all the players that I've played cricket with all went back to work once they'd retired, myself included. You know, I went and worked for, for, for a bank in South Africa. I have a Bachelor of Commerce degree. So it was kind of the natural progression. Stop playing, go back to work. Let's talk about that. What, what lessons did you learn in cricket? that you could perhaps implement in the workplace or things that shaped you in cricket that made a difference for you as it helped you make a difference with other people in the workplace yeah i think cricket's always a you know obviously a team game i, I played tennis but my favorite part of tennis was doubles i hated being you know playing singles because i've always been a part of of a larger structure and i suppose in an organization the same lessons apply or the same you know, uh, skills and, and, and sort of people development w within an organization exactly like a cricket team. So I was really fortunate as a young player. Um, my, my dad was a school principal and, and also a teacher at the, and, and a, um, a coach at the same school. Mm -hmm. And from his point of view, he was coaching eight or nine year old children. And uh, I remember playing in the first team, he asked me to come down to his practice and Jonty, watch these guys. They're going to run around for two hours. And at the end of the lesson, he said, what do you think these guys learned? And I said, not much. They had fun. They read in the face. They've been sweating. And he said, that's a, you know, you, you always be told by your coaches and your teachers that practice makes perfect. And he said, that's half the story because it's actually perfect practice that makes perfect. So it was a case of going, every time you play, every time you practice, you've got to put yourself in a match situation because that same intensity in a game it's really hard to emulate and practice because you've got second opportunities. Mm. But in it, what it basically was, was it was a part of my sort of my team culture, so what I brought to the organization. So, and the organization then was a cricket team. So I think it was really important because people do try and we've had interesting times, you know, in, in the last two, three years, people have been working from home. Now there's hybrid scenarios or, or people are back in the office. And, and it was so important to, to sort of generate a team culture within a cricket side because you've got different skills, you've got different abilities and you want people to bring that uniqueness into the organization. You want to clone everybody, but you still need to have the team's goals in mind. So, you know, I, I think a lot of the lessons that I learned were from sort of management down. We, we had different types of leadership. Some were very authoritarian where this is what you do and this is how you do it. And, and as we got better and more experience was in a case of, okay, so these are the team's goals which we've decided on as an organization, as a team we've decided where we want to go. And the captain would then back you to get there, utilizing your skills and your way of doing things. So, you know, there, there are many elements of, of cricket and, and sport in a team environment that certainly are applicable in, in an organization. And I believe you, you, you talk about this thesis in some of your talks around the world where you're kind of educating people on the lessons that you can learn from sport and implement them in the workplace. Yeah, you know, I've, obviously cricket in India is, is really huge. I, I probably spend half the year in India and, um, you know, so a, a lot of that is coaching and then a lot of it is especially towards the end of a, end of a calendar year um, or even the end of a financial year. There's a lot of sort of um, introspection and, and what's happened in, in, in the past 12 months and then what is the plan for the you know going forward and and again a lot of that sort of team culture the, the lessons that that I picked up from cricket um, and and for me a lot of it is sort of freedom to fail and I've seen that you know the changes that have taken place over the game not just in T20 uh, the way the Sri Lankans batted in the World Cup in 1996 was a great lesson for me where you know they were very innovative and innovation is not always about using technology that no one's ever seen or heard of before sometimes innovation is just 
doing what you're doing slightly differently, just with a different perspective. And, and that was such a good lesson for me because nowadays a, a big concern for people is AI. And you know, mm. technology is going to take my job away from me. And it's, you know, so they, they're worried and concerned about how change is going to affect their, their working environment. And, and for me, it was, you know, very much a case of, okay, let's, let's use technology to make us better. And as I said, it's not always just this, you know, brand new thing that's sparkling and new and no one's ever heard of. It's sometimes just your, your attitude towards what you're currently doing or the way that you adjust what you're currently doing from a different perspective. And, and that can be innovation. And, and I think, you know, we know change is constant. It's happening all the time. Mm. And it's, that was a big lesson for me as a cricket player that mm. you can't turn your back on change mm. and you can't just embrace it because that's kind of keeping up with the opposition. Mm. So when it comes to change, you want to be innovative. You want to be, you know, the people making, or bringing in the innovation into the game because keeping up with the opposition, you know, that's, that's way tougher. Mm. Um, Teams can do that and be successful for a short period of time, but mm. to be world champions over a longer, consistent period of time, you want to be constantly innovating the way you're doing things. You spoke of 1992, the, your first World Cup, South Africa's first World Cup, and uh, two moments that I recall very clearly from there. One is South Africa needing an indeterminable amount of runs off the last ball, yeah. but it was a heartbreak for South Africa. But then the special moment, the, the run out of Enzo Ul Haq, where you've been graced so many, so many children's walls with that Superman dive and that. Tell us about that. Well, well the dive was interesting. I mean, the, the two things around that World Cup in, in 1992. So firstly, we had no international experience and because we had come from the sort of the sporting sanction era and Kepler Vessels was, was the captain of the side and he just said, guys, you know, there's two areas that we can be the best in the world. We can be the fittest team and the best fielding team. So as a, as a side, we really wanted to bring a, a, a new element to the game. And in that, I, I stood out just because I was a hockey player and tennis player. And as a football player, change of direction was something that you do constantly. Whereas cricket often is kind of a straight line running. You know, you, as a bowler, you run up to the wickets in a straight line. As batters, when you run between the wickets, it's all a straight line. So me being sort of a low center of gravity and having all the different sports brought in difference and adding some speed to it as well gave me a, you know, a unique set of skills that I could use in the field. And when the run out happened, I mean, my career literally was launched. People in South Africa hardly knew me prior to that. I mean, I was selected that kind of people raised a few eyebrows, you know, leaving out Jimmy Cook and leaving out Clive Rice. And at one stage it looked like Peter Kirsten wasn't going to, these real legends, mm. you know, of South African cricket. Mm. And I got selected and Mike Proctor, I remember in one of the interviews saying, oh, this guy, John T. Rhodes, he's going to do something special in the field. He didn't say he's going to run into this, because obviously it never happened, I'd never practiced that before. But at the time, it was about utilizing my strengths. So again, you know, a great business lesson for me was that if people can play to, or work to their strengths, then their mm. growth is exponential. Spend time in areas that mm. they are passionate about. So fielding, fielding for me was a passion. Batting was my job. I had to do it, and I had to obviously fix the mistakes that I had. And and, and a test average of thirty-five. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, not, it was that's not too shabby. No, no, I had an average of yeah, my average was average, which was probably consistent with my my ability as a bat. I was an average batter, and, and in tough tough times. I would sort of contribute in, 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 in when we were in, in dire situations. That was when sort of my best performances were delivered to the team. But just going back to that run out, it was again making decision whether to throw the ball at the stumps or use my, use my speed against Inzimam, the, the Pakistan batter. And it, it was, I didn't trust. And at the start of my career, my accuracy wasn't something that I backed, whereas my speed was definitely in the split second it just felt like okay I can get there faster than him I gathered the ball and was never going to throw the ball at the stumps because we had to get a wicket and uh, I could see him coming back kind of sooner than I anticipated and from my point of view it was I've got to get to the stumps as quickly as possible I was I look like a real idiot so that full length dive was the fastest way for me to cover those last two two or three meters and fortunately the umpire could have said not out but he put his finger up because I would look really silly if I'd done all of that and crashed into the stumps and he'd said not out where I could have thrown and possibly hit the stumps. So back my strength, which was my speed and not my accuracy at that stage. And that was one of 72 runouts, which is still a record in one day internationals. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, because fielding, 
you know, I, I played in a one-day game and in, in, in Mumbai in 1993 against the West Indies. And I took five catches in, 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 in the game. And I was told afterwards, you know, what's it like to have a world record? I said, what? There's a record for fielding. I mean, nobody even, mm. you know, at the end of the day, it was who scored what runs and what your bowling figures. There was, there was never anything about catches and runouts and that was ever remarked about. So I didn't even know there was a, a world record for, for catches or for fielding. But I must say that the fielding for me was was never a, was never about and maybe it was a good thing I didn't know because I, I never had to better my performance in the field. I mean I was I was loving what I did, and I think it came across whether it was 90 overs in a test match, which is six hours in a day. I was running the same amount in the last over as I was because a lot of guys will start the game with energy and enthusiasm, mm -hmm. but as the heat and the day mm -hmm. wears on. Mm -hmm their energy levels dip. I was always somebody that had the same amount of energy at the end of the day. And it wasn't about breaking records because I really had no idea that these sort of records even existed on, on, on a fielding perspective. Mm. So it was just about having as much fun as possible. That's a good way to pass six hours in the sun. Mm. You know? So let's talk about the transition from, from playing to coaching and specifically being a fielding coach. Um, what would typically comprise the role of a fielding coach? Is it fitness drills? Is it, is it practice drills that are throwing? Or is it a combination of everything? Or what is your, do you have a secret sauce that you can bring to a team? Everyone's kind of wondering, we've got the best fielding person ever in the world to create the fielding, he's our fielding coach. And the Mumbai Indians, who you're acting for now in this SA Top 20. Um, no, Durban Super Giants, play it against. Durban no. Super Giants, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. Tell us about that. Well, we, I mean, we've, at the start of my coaching career, you know, Graham Smith had asked me to come with the South African team at the 2007 Cricket World Cup. Mm -hmm. So for 18 months, I just did their 50 over cricket because it wasn't T20. And also one of the first fielding coaches, they, they, you know, there weren't any, prior to this Indian Premier League being launched in, in 2008, there weren't many jobs for coaches because most teams just had one coach and that was usually an ex-player from the country. So when, when Graham asked me to, Working for Standard, Standard Bank in South Africa, by then no longer business banking, but as the sponsorship manager for White Ball Cricket in South Africa. Mm. So the bank was quite happy for me to join the team mm. um, as much as possible to sort of foster a relationship because the commercial side of cricket as a sponsor, it's always, inter I mean, everyone, you know, there's so many stakeholders in the game and the players at that stage needed to be educated that all of us, and I say we as a, as a sponsor, we were all passionate about cricket too. Because it's you know the cricket players sometimes feel that they're the custodians of the mm. cricket. The cricket board feels they're the custodians. The sponsors are passionate. They also would like to they understand their role, but they you know they they're passionate too. So my role at Standard Bank was you know join up the team as a fielding coach, one of the first sort of fielding coaches worldwide, and then with the introduction of of T20 cricket and specifically the IPL in 2008 every team then realized that you know there is a need and t20 cricket fielding has become the third element it's no longer just batting and bowling mm. so having someone like myself i bring energy and and i think that's what's important in, in in 20 overs especially in india i mean it's the hottest time of the year it's sort of april may june mm. and you need to have energy for 20 overs it doesn't seem like a long time but it, it's very sapping so the energy, again, the intensity for me is about the practice way. I mean, the way that you practice. So practice, even if it's seven minutes to ten minutes, I would rather have high intensity practice because the guys are already out in the field for two or three hours of practice. So I can't put them through an hour of fielding because mm. they'll be exhausted. So it was very much bringing the same levels of, of energy intensity that I have as a cricket player to my coaching. But the biggest lesson that, that I've learned from, from a coaching point of view, and, and again, it's very applicable in business, is that we really focus on the process, not the outcome. Because otherwise, you know, it's up and down. As a cricket player, you win, you lose, you win, you lose. And as a coach, once the game starts, there's not a lot you can do. You can add, offer some advice, and you know, you can kind of talk to the players at the breaks. But the game starts, you, you, you hand them over, and, and mm. there's not a lot you can do from a results perspective. So. When people are focused only on the outcome, it's such an emotional roller coaster. So that's, that's what we try and do. You, you, you want to support players. That freedom, that the same, I watched the Sri Lankan guys change the way the cricket was played just mm. by playing with this freedom to fail. Because if, if they're worried about, if I go for the ball and if I dive and I drop it, Jonty's going to you know, give me a negative mark in his book. 
I give people a negative mark if they stand there and they one, you know, the ball goes past without them diving. Because then, you know, I say if you don't go, you'll never know. Mm. And and that's where the freedom to fail comes in. Because if they're more concerned about failing, because John T, you know, is going to mark us or the, the owner's going to be upset with us, um, rather than going for the ball and maybe it will stick or maybe they'll stop it and even take the pace off it and save a four and the people only run two. So that has been something that I've introduced was just that, you know, I'd rather you go for the ball than stand there and, and worry about if I drop it, what's Jonty going to say? So it's almost changing the paradigm as opposed to just improving your fitness and improving your, your drills. It's a mental shift, your confidence to do something extraordinary. Well, the most amazing thing about sport is that there's so many people with ability, you know, and in any sport and in any country, but and most of the difference is from the shoulders up between your ears. And, and, and that generally is about, do you have the confidence or just the ability to turn out the negative? Because there is so much, there is so much noise, and not just in a stadium. When you quietly at practice on your own, it's you, yourself, you know, the doubts that come through. So, and, and you know, I, I think we all need, we know we have weaknesses, but like me with my epilepsy, I had uh, limits to what I could do in the sports that I could play. But understanding those limits and, and you know, you can work around them, you can work through them and you can, you can sort of grow them. But it, there's a lot of doubt in, in, in players and, and to have that freedom, it's not just you yourself. It comes from the support structure and that support structure is me as a coach. Mm. You know, you, you almost have to be a mentor as well as a coach. You've got to encourage people to go that extra mile or take the risk to possibly fail because that's when you're going to take your game to the next level. Mm. So it's obviously from Sweden, a very different contrast to India now where you spend six months of the year, I think you're living in Goa, and where you still hold demigod status and being followed around and asked for hundred for autographs. Tell us about that. Yeah, India, so firstly, you, weather wise is totally different. Um, cricket, 1.3 billion people who are passionate about the game and, you know, in my position now, if I'm doing corporate sort of leadership stuff, a lot of the, the audience will be in their 35 to 45 sort of range. So they were youngsters growing up and, mm. and still remember the dart. They actually watched it. In fact, some of them will talk about the 1992 World Cup that they watched on television as six or seven year old kids and everyone just fell off their sofas. What is this guy doing? Because fielding wasn't a thing in India mm. um, specifically because the fields are always so hard. You know, they don't have great facilities. But the success of, of the game in India has seen a huge growth in it. You know, obviously the IPL, the Indian Premier League, has brought a business side to it. But then the national team has been ranked number one, you know, in, in tests and T20 and 50 over cricket. So from Dhoni to Kohli, obviously Sachin Tendulkar in my generation was kind of a man on, on, on his own mission, standing alone. Um, he really has God status in India. But the, the prowess of the Indian team, not just in India, but when they've traveled abroad, abroad and being competitive, and now seeing the growth in, in, in girls' and women's cricket in India has been amazing, you know, because it's been a very patriarchal society, mm. and, uh, and now families are, are prepared to give young girls the opportunity. So if I go coaching an academy of, of sort of 30, 30 kids, there'll be at least five of them will be young girls mm. because there's now a, a women's Premier League, um, there's obviously w women's World Cups and, and T20 World Cups. So the growth of the game has been phenomenal from, from that perspective. And it's, you know, I, I enjoy living in India. It can be a little bit much because it's, it is non-stop. Even if it's only 10 people, that queue never just goes away because as two leave, two more join. You know, you almost have to then say, I'm very sorry, I'm going to catch the aeroplane or I have to go. Mm. And, uh, but we've, we've decided to live in a very, very small part of, of India. It, it's on a beach. It, it's, it's literally a village. So I know the whole village is only about a thousand people. So they've had their selfies, they've met the family. And now after four months, you know, they just wave and, and don't have to come over and, and sort of take up your time. But the rest, as you travel through mm -hmm. India, it's, it can get to you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I kind of put myself back into the days as a young player and you see smiles on people's faces. And, and, and that's a huge privilege, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people, a lot of the players not take it for granted because it is draining and they don't have the time to stop. And, and, and as I said, the line never goes mm -hmm. away. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I always feel it's there's way more benefits that have come from my popularity than negatives. So if I can make somebody remember, you know, or talk about me, then having signed an autograph or stood for a selfie, then, you know, I think I'm, I'm in the right direction because people leave there with a positive attitude rather than, well, okay, he just blew me off or brushed me off. 
So it, it's an interesting place. I'm often, my wife does have to remind me, John T, mm. he might be your 20th selfie of the morning, but for him, that's his only selfie with you. So, so don't forget that. And mm. that's an important lesson. So fortunately, as a, as a team, my wife is, you know, in India, reminding me occasionally just to be a decent human being. And we often forget we need that support behind us in the family environment to be successful. I mean, that's obviously a big part. Yeah, I've been, I've been really fortunate as always having played in a team. So I appreciate partnerships um, because whether you're batting or bowling or, or in the field, you know, without the partnerships, one person is not going to, you know, 20 over cricket maybe, that's changed slightly, and over can change the game. But generally, it's about teamwork and, and, and it's about the support because I'm not going to have a great day every day. I, I know that. And, and without the partnership, without the support of that, you know, it, it's really tough to consistently just keep being on your A game because life gets to you, mm -hmm. you know, and it gets to all of us, and no matter what environment that you're in. And life for John T. Rose now, what does it entail? What are your future aspirations? Well, what are you doing? I, mean, I keep talking about change and, and how, how constant that is. And, and I think from, from my point of view, obviously cricket is something that, that I'm still passionate about. And I love being able to, to give back and, and be involved in, 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 this, in this great sport. But I think, you know, from a change perspective, uh, and, and it, it's kind of, it, it happened through the pandemic where we've seen remote work remote learning is possible. I mean, I know that a lot of the parents hated it when the mm. kids were stuck at, at home and having to, you know, to take school from a home point of view. But as a cricket coach, I, I've learned a lot of stuff off social media, you know, mm. because throwing is not something that it's, it's big in, in, in cricket coaching. Fielding is usually about catching and stopping the ball. So I've, I've been studying baseball and softball because there it's, it's all about the technique and, and youngsters are taught really good techniques. So I've brought that in. So, you know, I, I want to be as a fielding coach and, and especially again in a country like India, getting requests all the time all, all around the world. Because now, as I said, the markets, you know, in Europe, in the US, um, all these new markets where they're looking for expertise. So going online, being digital, I mean, it just makes sense to me. And I think there's always been a, an apprehension about, well, if you're not physically there, can you impart the same sort of energy and, and, and the same sort of vibe? Um, and, and, and again, cricket's a game of habit, so you want people to go back to it every day. Mm. So that is possible online. You know, I can be there for two or three days to excite the people, you know, show them the skills and the drills, but if it's not maintained over a month, those skills that you've shown them are never going to be brought into the sort of their own game mm. as, a part of, as a part of their habits, their daily habits. So, so online coaching is something that I'm excited about because mm. I think there's, there's huge opportunity and, and there's scope for that mm -hmm. in, 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 in most industries, you know. Um, and again, it's, it's sort of a part of, of, of the changing economy and uh, just turning sort of my back on it and saying I'm not really a you know, tech savvy guy. So maybe mm. there's, I mean, there are great apps around that can from a coaching perspective, you can show people where they are and what they should be doing um, and let them build towards that. So, so that for me is pretty exciting. And then in the wellness space, you know, a lot of what I do when I go to India and, and I talk to, to employees, I'm always concerned about the wellness of people. And, and India has a, a population where we all think that the food in India is very spicy, but there's a lot of sweet, a lot of sugar um, in, in the diet. And I was always brought into, you know, my, my goal or my role as a speaker was to motivate people to improve productivity, work harder. Mm. And I just started talking to management and saying, you know, I've had captains where who've understood each player as an individual and what their needs are. And, and I know that with, you know, 300 employees, it's impossible to know everybody's needs, but you've got leadership within that, mm. within the corporate. And then it's about going, okay, so, understanding what people need so so corporate wellness and health is something that i'm i'm really focused on going forward in india so online coaching and 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 even even the corporate wellness is also mm. online coaching so my parents are both teachers so no surprise in the fact that hey i want to teach as well mm -hmm. i think we're just about out of time yet john it's been a, a real pleasure getting to know the man behind the pictures and the posters before we go uh, a word perhaps for aspiring cricket fans and fans around the world who, who admire you and who see you as a role model? Yeah, I think, T. Roger, there are so many unknowns in, in our environment. You, you know, it, it's, whether it be in a work environment, whether it be at school, whether it be in the sport that you're playing. And, and for me, the, the, the whole 
belief that I had about the freedom to fail and if you don't go you'll never know and, and I'm at this, in this scenario now where I've been talking about online coaching I've been talking about wellness for five years and finally this is something that I know I need to commit to because I, I've also been in a situation where deeper what if it doesn't work or what if I'm not good at this or if, if it fails and, and I think that is so important man if you don't go you will never know so, so, so from that point of view my message to and it applies to everything that you do whether it's a school whether it's sport whether it's art and culture um, whether it's a business environment starting a new venture if you don't go you'll never know take the first step that's all you need to do I love that if you don't go you'll never know life is short so John T it's been a pleasure thank you so much for spending your time with us and we look forward to seeing you on the screens around the world cool thanks Roger thanks for having me pleasure Cheers.